Preseason basketball is underway for about two weeks now. We are entering about week two or week three, depending on how you measure it. What does everything you are seeing in preseason mean in terms of translating up to the NBA regular season playoffs, projecting forward long term? Going to talk about some of the overview of what to watch for this preseason, what actually could translate to the regular season, and then just some other elements of preseason that I have watched that I have found really meaningful. Coming up on Locked On NBA Big Board. You are Locked On NBA Big Board, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up? My name is Richard Stamen. You might know me better as at Mavs Draft on Twitter. Uh, right here on the bottom left of the screen is my handle. I am credentialed throughout college basketball um, events that I've been to, whether it be combines, uh, private events, high school, college, whatever it is. Uh, I've been credentialed at a lot of places, been able to see a lot over the five years I've been doing so. Um, but you can probably know me better as at Mavs Draft. I've uh, been posting a lot on Twitter recently about some preseason, which has really inspired me to start this episode. And before I start this episode, though, I do want to thank each and every one of you who continues to listen, whether it be on Spotify, Apple, whatever, Stitcher, whatever, whatever platform you are using to get your podcast. I greatly appreciate it. And shout out to the YouTube crew. We're still pretty small trying to grow on that. Uh, if you don't mind hitting us with a subscribe would really mean a lot, but we're also on YouTube as well, locked on NBA Big Board. So thank you to everybody who continues to listen and watch. Really means a lot. Uh, I know I'm, I move a lot with my hands and head. You can see it as I'm doing, I'm watching myself just move everywhere. I appreciate your um, your patience with me and everything. And shout out to anybody watching. Got, a, got an old school Trey Lyles uh, jersey on here that I got about six years ago. But anyways, moving on to the actual point of this episode, the preseason. I put out an episode, or excuse me, I put out a tweet. I'm going to post it here on the YouTube. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see. I got a variety of answers. I actually got some magnificent answers. A lot of them were about rotations and sets. Uh, some people saying, you know, like shout out to RB3. He said, you know, my favorite team's not often included in postseason activity, so I become anxious to see them run again. The offseason added anticipation for me. As you know, he's a Knicks fan. Um, Robert is a, is a big Knicks fan, so they had a big offseason, as you might have heard from uh, the Jalen Brunson news and everything. But lineup changes, growth of players, getting to watch your squad hoop. Like it's all relative. And I think that was probably the best answer that really stood out to me. Um, there are people who are talking about, you know, players that are likely going to take on a bigger role, whatever it was. There were a lot of really good answers. And to me, I'll break down some of those that I think actually I could apply to what I have seen. But I want to thank everybody for answering that really, I was on a plane flying back home and I thought about it and I'm like, you know, I watch it. I, I was watching a game on my computer during, during the flight. I luckily had internet that, or the like, you know, the free, whatever entertainment that had a game on. I was very lucky. And I was watching and I was like, dang, you know, like I'm watching this one way. And it's not like the regular season where everybody is watching for like one overarching goal. It's to see how their team is doing and how the players are doing. Like one way or another, they're connected. With preseason, it's just not that way. Like, what are you watching for? So I kind of have taken some different angles on a few guys that I will talk about coming up, but just wanting to do the overview on this is for me, when I watch preseason, I look for a few things and I'll kind of answer my own question. I'll start it with each of them. So for me, I mean, I've been a fan of basketball since I was five years old. I mean, probably younger, but I can remember being five. I was four, uh, really four actually, because my first life memory was going to an Orlando magic game when I lived there. And I fell in love with the game. I remember so many details about it. Penny Hardaway was there. Probably way too much for something that happened over 20 years ago. But Penny Hardaway was there. You know, I remember being in the old Amway Center uh, or Amway Stadium, whatever it was called. Um, I learned to read through NBA transaction pages. So I've grown up with the game. For me, I'm always just happy to see basketball on my screen. So there's always that element where I'm like, oh, dang, like this guy just did something nice. I can appreciate it. But when I'm watching preseason, I'm like, okay, cool. It's mostly a thumbs up. More than anything, and you know, you if you follow me, you've seen me tweet some nice plays and stuff. Uh, when I get really into it, I like sharing what I see, so it's more of that than anything else. But the next thing is, how does your team look? 
And for me, this is a really interesting one. There are a lot of people who talked about rotations and lineups and things like that. And I think that's a really interesting point. A lot of teams are running very experimental lineups right now. You look at the Dallas Mavericks. Obviously, I'm biased. I'm at Mavs draft. I watch the Mavs as much as I possibly can. And I, I write about them. I analyze them. They have some chemistry in lineup changes. Like you look at, nobody knows who the starting shooting guard is going to be. Jason Kidd has made it very clear there are a few guys that are going to be off the bench, including Tim Hardaway Jr., Christian Wood, and now Spencer Dinwiddie opens up a whole new element where people are watching and they go, hey, let's see what this guy can do. We've seen Josh Green. We've seen Jaden Hardy. I'll talk about those two in particular coming up um, and what I think the Mavs lineup will be just from this preseason and everything. But, uh, you know, that's a really interesting element. I think there's a lot. You look at the Orlando Magic, the other team, if you saw that tweet right here where I, if, if you're watching on YouTube, So I have to shout out the Magic in this. Like I, I said, I'm from Orlando. I've kept up with them too. The Magic have run some really interesting lineups. We saw them run like a, a jumbo jumbo lineup where it was pretty much four guys above six eight and a point guard. So obviously that stuff's never going to happen in the preseason, but or excuse me, the regular season. But some blend of that is going to happen, and I think that's a really interesting development. And also, I think a, a key point of this is players build chemistry and. To me, I think that's really important. How do guys look when they're on the floor together? A lot of people think every pick and roll ball handler will mesh with every shooter or roller, whatever it is, because the skill sets generally are so simple that they match, but they just don't actually work together because their their cadences are off, things like that. Whatever it is, they just don't mesh. So I've always found that to be a little bit interesting. And then another element of it, uh, the rookies and newcomers. The, the rookies and newcomers, I think, is a really – Really fascinating one. Obviously, I'm out here in the trenches. I'm watching Lester Quinones, um, you know, whoever it may be that you want to find as an obscure player. I'm out here watching it because I dove way too far into prospects that I had no business diving into this last year, the year before, the year before that, whatever it was. And I like seeing how they're doing in the NBA, maybe saying, hey, that guy might stick. I think it's fun. Now, a lot of rookies are kind of thrown into the fire and they're just like, hey, do your thing, see how you look, because so many of them are fighting for their actual NBA lives. One example of this is somebody who didn't really pan out, but he had a great preseason. He was an undrafted free agent. Shout out to Nick and Isaac on Locked On Mavs. They actually, I loved, like when I was listening to the show way back when, uh, John Clavel was somebody who I absolutely loved. He started in 2017. He was in that Dennis Smith draft, but he was undrafted from Colorado State. Absolutely balled out in the preseason. And he wasn't really like, there wasn't a roster fit that I think he addressed or anything. He was a scorer, kind of, mostly a shooter. He had the nickname from Locked On Mavs, Jiverson. Didn't really pan out, but you know some of these guys, they say, hey, I have talent, and they show it. John Covell was one of the ballers of the preseason, only played seven NBA games, which, again, begs the question, what does the preseason mean? Like He's not making a comeback. He is already 28, about to be 29 in just a few, like in, in a month. So what do you make of it? It makes it really hard to be a fan, I think, in terms of trying to analyze the game and figuring out who's – Who's real, what's real, and what can actually be sustained long-term. And that's kind of what makes preseason fun, and that's why I like breaking it down. And then there's the last thing, which is the development and new skill. Uh, I'll leave the miscellaneous answers for you know, for you to come up with if you want to just respond to me while you're listening to this or whatever, and I can't hear you. But the new skills is something that I think is always fascinating. We just saw Sunday night, Andre Drummond went, what, three of three from three. Now, I want to preface, he's been doing that for years. He's an all-time preseason shooter. Not actually. I, I'm I'm in the club of, yeah, maybe he fixes mechanics, but I'm not believing it until I see it. So how do you develop? How do you actually buy into things like that? Because Andre Drummond, like I mean, even last year, I think Ivica Zubac did this too. Zubac is not shooting threes. He maybe could one day, but like it's not happening. And it's almost for fun because if you know anything about these NBA guys, they're super skilled. Uh, they can do things like Mitchell Robinson. There was a video a couple years ago where he was a point guard. It would never happen in the NBA. It's a chance for them to showcase it. I think it's really interesting, but the new skills and developments, I think, are guys, and I'm going to talk about some of these coming up. I don't want to kind of throw it all in the this first portion of the show, but there's a lot of elements where it's like, dang, when did this guy start doing this? I mean, for me, I'll, I'll spill one bean, which is the Orlando Magic. I was watching Paolo Boncaro. Where was this creativity at Duke? They were running pick and rolls for him as the ball handler. He was doing everything, things I'd never seen him do at Duke. And I just I didn't know where some of this stuff came from. Not to say he didn't run pick and rolls, but the creativity of the pick and rolls, having the five out, things like that. It's like, okay, does 
what we just wrong in our evaluations because this preseason is showing he was good at it. He found his rollers. He knew when to find the shooters, cutters, whatever it was. He did whatever he wanted out of the pick and roll. And it's like, okay, is this a new element that we have to consider for his long-term upside? Is that an overreaction? Is it just guys being guys and kind of just playing, having fun? Like, what is it? And to me, that's the fun of the preseason. For me, my if I had to answer what do you watch for in the preseason, I'm going for two things. I'm trying to see, dang, it's like, and, and actually, before I do this, remember Harrison Barnes. This is one, one reason why I'm about to give the answer I give. Harrison Barnes in 2016 had the like, most Nick Anderson moment since Nick Anderson, where he just he couldn't hit water. And it kind of carried into the preseason. People were like, oh, this is a bad signing. This is a bad signing. It may, may or may not have been. I don't think personally it was, given he produced. They weren't a better team, but it also really didn't hurt him. I don't think his massive contract was that bad. But Harrison Barnes in the preseason, people were ready to write him off, things like that. And... I don't know. I just, I think a lot of it doesn't actually matter for me. It's watch for the young guys, mainly the fringe guys. Can they actually contribute with an impact, not just with their talent, like John Clavel, but can somebody actually stick, make an impact in winning basketball for consistent minutes? And it's hard to say, obviously you're never going to get this right. It's not something that can just be answered in one yes or no question, but I really like seeing that. I like seeing, Hey, maybe this is a skill that we can see in three years. Like if Andre Drummond, I thought, I thought that would happen happen by now in a real game where he could actually shoot given how many times he did in the preseason. Some guys just have it. Some kind of guys just really don't in that regard. So for me, my big thing, why I watch preseason, I'm trying to analyze it a little bit and see which guys can become very end of bench and turn into rotation players. And I think that's the most exciting way they it's you have a little bit of a safety net they're going to be on the team guys like Patrick Baldwin Jr. for example how does he fit in he's played a lot of fourth quarter minutes uh, in their last game against I think it was the Lakers and you know I, I'm excited about things like that I think if it were you know from my approach that's just how I do it he played seven minutes still got four shots up it was all kind of garbage time he played with Ty Jerome that was it but what can you look for and I don't know I'm excited for preseason but Let's talk about some of the other stuff coming up, what I've seen in preseason, including like Keegan Murray, the Mavs, the Magic. Also, I'm going to dive a little bit more into Patrick Baldwin uh, on the other side of this. But let me tell you about our friends over at. If you haven't tried the Built Bar Puffs yet, you are depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. Guess what? There's a new flavor. I told you about it last week. Delicious indulgent cookie dough with puffs. They're covered in chocolate. That's right, Built has done it again. Let me introduce you to your new favorite, Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs. They have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks, and of course, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. You get all the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it, plus it's healthy for you. They're only 160 calories, and they have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. So run to Built.com and snag a box for you and the family. It'll be the perfect treat. Like all Built Bars, the new Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs are covered in 100% real chocolate, that means they're both healthy and tasty. Chocolate-covered cookie dough with a light, fluffy texture. It is delicious. What's great about Built is that all of their bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits, eating something that tastes good and is good for you. You're going to love the new cookie dough chunk puffs. Whether you need a snack for your workout, late-night treat, or just need to grab a quick bite, Built is the perfect protein bar, and they taste better than a candy bar. Ditch the calories, fat, and sugar. Grab yourself a Built Bar. Go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKEDON15 and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKEDON15. Locked on NBA Big Board. Again, you know me. My name is Richard Stamen at Mavs Draft on Twitter. I talked about some of the preseason stuff that stood out. I'm going to talk about two of the Bay Area guys real quick. So the I talked about how development is key to me. And let's continue with that. Keegan Murray. I have been incredibly impressed with what we have seen in every single day and way of the offseason with Keegan Murray. Since the draft, I mean, he has just been outstanding. You look at every role he's been asked to play, he has thrived in it. And not only that, I mean, the basketball IQ is just every single angle it pops. I really think it's such an overreaction to even say something like this, but I think this is one of those times where it's just obvious and you just know. Keegan Murray's really good, and I genuinely think he's going to stick in the NBA, and he'll be a good pick. Like, he, he will safely be a good pick. Maybe they – maybe, you know, people say, eh, they shouldn't have taken him. There was somebody else that – like Tari Eason or something. Like, he may be a better player long-term, but you never know. It's not like you're drafting a bad player. I, I just – I'm enamored by how well the Kings did with this pick and I, or how well I think they will have done with this pick. I'm not going to say it's already sealed or anything because we haven't seen a real minute of NBA basketball. But – Let's take, for example, what happened Sunday night. He went five of six from the field uh, in, with Sacramento. All of those were threes. And every single one of them was a spot-up three. 
that's incredible for a guy who his entire game in college was quick offense, get to the rim, can spot up occasionally. But I would say spot up shooting was one of his weaknesses relative to his strengths. Like it wasn't not something that it was bad at that he was bad at, but like it definitely wasn't something I would have been like, all right, do this, do it again, do it again. Cause like they can exploit him. That's not at all what I would have had on him. So for me, I've been impressed by his shooting. I think you've seen it in summer league at every level, movement shooting, spot up shooting, off the dribble, behind screens, whatever it is. He has been truly magnificent at it. And he had 16 points just doing the simple things, just fitting into offense. And that's why I think he's going to fit really well in Sacramento. They have a front court hole. Yeah, they still don't have a rim protector because him and Sabonis just, Keegan Murray's a good defender. I've talked about this. He had more games with a block last year, Keegan Murray, than Walker Kessler did, um, which is just nuts. Granted, Walker Kessler also had multiple games of like five and four blocks. So not not quite one-to-one, but it is still a remarkable stat. And for me, it was like, the way I see it is, he's going to fit into any role he's asked, whether it's next to DeMontis Simonis as an off-ball player, whether it's next to whatever center is there to be a interior presence, stay at the rim, both ends, don't do much creation, anything, let Keegan create, play off-ball next to, Ke- uh, to De'Aaron Fox, Davion Mitchell, whoever it is, be a threat next to Harrison Barnes, rotate in and out, play defense. I mean, that's a big one. Like I've only talked about the offense and I think the defense is going to be great too, because he was great at it in college. So for me, Keegan Murray has been phenomenal. I just wanted to shout him out. I genuinely do think that he is uh, going to be just an all rookie player just because you see how he's fit in every single way. Again, I know like reacting to preseason this way, it's not the most rational all the time. But also, like, the signs are obvious. He's been able to do every role he's been asked. He might go in through some shooting slumps like every rookie does, but you're never going to see him lost in these roles he's asked to play. And and he can play a lot of these roles. And, you know, it's obvious when you're a forward that can do a lot of different things, you're a really valuable player. Those are – it's probably the best position to be versatile in. And Keegan Murray is that on both ends of the floor. I think that's phenomenal. The other one who has stood out to me, I don't know his stats, to be honest. I've been trying to find preseason stats are just not that – available but Patrick Baldwin Jr. has actually really impressed me if you know like Raphael and I did some shows we were very low on him heading into the draft and I know it's just preseason so I'm not like actually gonna say oh I was wrong like I was right whatever it is I'm not gonna overreact like that and I'm not speaking for Raphael or anything on this like I think we're both pretty level-headed on this and knowing he's not gonna play a ton of minutes especially year one but There's been one thing that I've noticed every single day that I've, every single game, I should say, that I've watched him. He does this one thing that really stands out to me, and that is the relocation. Whenever he is going, like, he's done a lot of these. He loves this post fake where he drives in, does a little outreach. Like, it's almost like the Rondo fake, but it's not as effective, obviously. But he does just a side fake, head fake, whatever it is. He goes to the post, does a fake. He'll pass out, and boom, immediately, right to his spot, in rhythm, to the elbow corner, somewhere in that range and hits the three. He's done it in almost every single game, and I think it's honestly phenomenal. I think it's something that will get him minutes as a spot-up shooter occasionally down the road, especially when injuries come up. If Moses Moody or something like that has a DNP, he might be the next man in line. I think it's a really interesting development. It's not something that's going to shatter the the NBA or anything, but, I mean, he was a first-round pick, uh, a surprising one to me and a lot of other people, just given how his Milwaukee in post-high school record had been. The shot has looked good. I think the shot has been sped up. Just mechanically speaking, it looks different than, than what I evaluated in pre-draft. So interested to see how Patrick Baldwin Jr. does. I want to talk about um, the, you know, the, the Mavs and Magic. Those are my two money makers of teams, you could say, being Mavs slash Magic draft. But first, let me tell you about prize picks. And we got the overlay on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. So, <clears throat> you know. Uh, we, we've been talking about some big names and stuff about putting up big performances. Uh, you can talk about, you know, some, I guess, Keegan Murray, right. Had 16 points. You can bet on some of these, these guys having big, big lines and things like that. Um, the way prize picks works is you pick two to five players. And if they score more or less than the prize picks projection, excuse me, projection, you can win up to 10 times the money on any entry. You're not competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. So if you want to say, hey, Steph's not going to hit more than three threes tonight, you can bet on that. Prize Picks offers projections on any sport you watch. This is NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college sports, down the line, WNBA, esports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing. I can go on and on. Euro basketball, if you're into that, like you watch Rafael for that, they got that too. 
Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. It's safe and fast withdrawals as well to, you know, cash out. And they are currently operated in over 30 states and in Canada. So download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. That's one word. If you deposit $100, PrizePix will give you $100. If you deposit $50, bucks, PrizePix will give you $50. Bucks. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on in one word at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. And you can see that right there, the, the bottom. That's where you can get the info for prize picks. So last part of the show, just want to talk about the Mavs and Magic draft, you could say, and, and some impressive and uh, quality standout things. So I'll start with the Orlando Magic. They actually played this weekend on, I want to say it was Friday night they played. And I saw some really interesting takeaways. So I'll start with the Mavs. One, you know, Jaden Hardy started slow. I think this has been a little bit of a theme in the preseason, but he got going. And when he got going, he actually was really good. His jump shooting was nice. He was not great getting to the rim. That was one thing that always really scared me. That's why I was so much lower on him. I loved the shot making ability and shot creation ability outside of the generally outside of like 15 ish feet, but inside the 15 feet, you know, he struggled. He started pretty slow. I think he was like two of six or something. And a lot of those were just, tough takes to the rim that defenses were winning against him. And obviously the Orlando magic are a very long team. So I get it, but he still recovered. I mean, he, he had a really quality game. I'm, I'm actually, I should have pulled this up now that I think about it, but Jaden Hardy still came away impressive. Just talking about what I see in the eye test is he never lost confidence. I think that's huge. You could also say the same stuff going for the Oklahoma city game in this, but he never lost confidence at all. I thought that was huge given the fact that he's a rookie. He had a, you know, he played in the G League, wasn't that productive and whatnot. I really liked what I saw from Jaden Hardy on Friday night, though, uh, for the full stats. So he had, uh, he was only two of eight. He, uh, so I I'm clearly got this mixed up with the Oklahoma City game, but regardless, he still did. And, and now it's all clicking. The Oklahoma City game was a lot better. But even in the Orlando Dallas game, he was making plays. He wasn't being sloppy with the ball. Yeah, he missed some shots, but it wasn't because. It was bad shots all the time. It was, And he'll take bad shots. Like I don't think he's even going to deny something like that. But ultimately, you see the process is there. Now, he's in the mix. I talked about this at the beginning. <clears throat> he's in the mix to be a starter. I personally don't see it. I think that's a big risk given his inefficiency. But as Rafael has always said, his off-ball play is outstanding. He can fit right next to Luka Doncic. They will fit hand and glove in a way. Like, I mean, you just all he has to do is spot up and just be a mistake-free player. Now, the hard part is the mistake-free is tough. He averaged a one-to-one assist-to-turnover ratio, very low field goal percentage. Can he make that work as a starter? I don't know. The other player in the mix is Josh Green. Josh Green has been absolutely raved about by the entire Mavs staff. Who knows? Maybe they're trying to boost his trade value. Maybe they're just playing all of us. But I think the eye test matches it. Josh Green looks confident. He, he's not scared to shoot. I watched him in his rookie year in that G League bubble where he played for the Salt Lake City or the Salt Lake Stars, whatever it is. And he looked really confident there. He was able to shoot off the dribble. He had no hesitation. He was hitting off the dribble step backs. Like he was doing a ton of stuff and he did the same thing against Orlando. He was hitting, he was just confident. And I think, you know, a lot of people say his mechanics look the same, whatever, but like, like what's different. And for me, confidence is just, that's, that's huge. If you have the same shot, but you're like, eh, it's not going to go in. Like a lot of shooting is mental. And if the mentality is there in a much different way for Josh Green, I think you're going to see that three-point percentage in a real volume actually be 36%. That's what it was last year, but he took one a game. A lot of those were in garbage time. Not that meaningful. So I'm really interested to see how that looks. And then also, I had to touch on it. There are two areas. One is more positive. I'll end with the negative. But as I transition to the Magic side, and that is um, the Christian Wood. This is the positive. I really liked what I saw from him. I still think he should be closing games over JaVale McGee. I get the presence of on defense and the interior presence, lob threat, things like that for JaVale. But at this moment in time, Christian Wood is the better player, the more effective player. And if played, and if he can stay in this rhythm he's built already in the preseason as just this versatile offensive player, he's clearly a better fit than JaVale McGee. I mean, he was hitting trailer threes. We, we haven't seen a ton of trailer threes since Porzingis left in Dallas outside of kind of Maxi Kleba, but I don't know. He's just not that great at it. Like, I think Christian Wood could be good at it. We've seen it already a couple of times. He only went three of 15 from transition threes in Houston last year. 
not only will that attempt number go up, but also that make number will go up. But then the other thing, the Spencer Dinwiddie push, I, I thought that was pretty weird uh, to say the least. I, I wasn't a fan of that at all. He hurt Suggs. I mean, just plain and simply pushed Suggs into an injury. Um, wasn't a fan of that at all. I'm not going to comment on any intent or anything like that because I don't know if there was any. But um, that really sucks. Like, just no way to put it. Jalen Suggs is probably going to miss about a month, month and a half. I'd say, knowing the Magic, he's probably going to make his his regular season debut right before Thanksgiving. So that's a it's about 50 days from now. That really is unfortunate because Jalen Suggs really needs every rep he can get. And, you know, the defense is always there. He was great on defense every moment he played in last season. And he's been good on defense in the preseason. Would have liked to see the offense develop because I, I buy his jump shot. We haven't seen it yet. Now, some other things. I'll be a little bit more positive. With the Orlando Magic, I talked about Paolo Boncaro. I mean, the, the star upside is just absurd. It, it is truly absurd. The pick and rolls are there. He only had one assist against the Magic, but, or excuse me, the Mavs. But you can just kind of tell he's, he's got so much going his way in that regard of playmaking that it wouldn't shock me if he ever averages at least five assists a game. Um, I, I think that's very realistic. He had three assists against San Antonio. That's where I, po- I saw it, and I was like, dang, he is re- he's making some sick reads out of the pick and roll. Like He found, I think it was like Bamba, or maybe it was just Wendell Carter, but he found one of them just rolling in such smooth motion that not even some of the guards can do. It was like Markel Fultz is the best pick and roll guard, I would say, on the Magic, and Markel couldn't even make some of those so- that smoothly. And Paolo Boncaro is 6'10", 6'11", as a forward, so... They can make him very versatile. I think that's key. I also like what I've seen from Cole Anthony on the offensive end. I think he's been really impressive. You look at just, he's trying to learn new ways, figure out how to use his eyes as and be more deceptive to open up some shots. I think this is the year we see Cole Anthony take a jump into the 40s for field goal percentage, which sounds kind of negative at first because his first two seasons, he's averaged 39.7% or shot 39.7% from the field. So pretty much 40 and 39% last year but i think he could easily get into 40 percent. there's a few things that make me confident in this one of them again just the skill development and things like that but also he doesn't have to take nearly as many bad shots as he's had to take the last two years palo boncaro solves so many issues he bails them out a lot more easily than guys like cole anthony markel fultz they could all do i think you're going to see overall efficiency with already an efficient franz wagner and wendell carter for example palo boncaro bolsters that so much and it allows cole anthony to play as an off-ball threat. And now I'm actually really curious. I'm going to look up what Cole Anthony's numbers were last season on the on spot-up attempts for Orlando. So let's take a look at this. So I'm pulling these up right now. Uh, this is through Synergy. Last year on catch-and-shoot threes, he shot 38%. That's really impressive, especially given that he shot 39% from the field and from overall three, 34%. So as you can imagine, what I'm about to read is off-the-dribble numbers aren't that great from three shot 29%. Now, if you give him somebody who can create out of the pick and roll and let him play off ball, what do you think those three point percentage numbers are going to do? And in turn that goes into field goal percentage are going to do. I think Cole Anthony's in for a big breakout season. It's going to be a big part of the magic core is having him break out. Still think he's a starter, especially with Jalen Suggs hurt. He's a big beneficiary. And also one last thing with the Orlando magic, uh, two last little parts. I'll say one in like one sentence, Wendell Carter, outstanding, still more and more versatile every single day. You're going to see the three-point percentage go up. And I lied, this is now sentence number two. Just an overall impact player that can fit with any player on that roster at any given time in any lineup. Really like that. The last thing, though, RJ Hampton deserves a lot of credit. He was absolutely criticized when he went to Summer League, really in a weird way. So it started with praise because he was like, you know, I want to get better. I want to get as many reps as I can get. Take me out to Vegas, even though I'm going to be one of the, the most experienced guys there. And honestly, he looked not good. He was overmatched. His offense wasn't good. People were really concerned. They were saying, hey, you know, the Magic need to, to figure something out with him. And in the preseason, he's been really good. He's found ways to get to his spots. He's passing. He's shooting. I really like what I've seen from him. I think he's another big beneficiary from the Jalen Suggs injury. Hope Suggs can get better. But all of this to be said, preseason basketball doesn't mean anything, but also it kind of does mean stuff. You can learn a little bit micro elements of players' games, kind of like I broke, tried to break down in a way. Maybe they're not so micro. But have fun with preseason. Don't be someone who says, oh, this person's a bust because they've been bad in preseason. Because you know what? Players are bad in preseason all the time. Like the number one scorer, I think, for preseason is somebody from Adelaide 36ers this year. So it doesn't mean anything in that regard. But you can also take some 
analyze uh, analysis, I should say, and see what works. But thank you so much for listening and watching Locked On NBA Big Board. You know where to find me, at Mavs Draft on Twitter. For your second listen of the day, <clears throat> go ahead and listen to Locked On NBA Season Preview. They've been absolutely killing it. They've been doing under 30 minutes. They're going team by team and everything. It's really fun. You should check it out wherever you get podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day.